Christoph, one of the questions I've always focused on is where is the core substrate of memory? And what's fascinating is that among neuroscientists, some would put it at the submicroscopic level or the molecules in the synapse. Others would say you need millions, if not more, of neurons in vast circuitry. So what is the minimum size of what you need to have an independent uh, uh, a memory that, that lasts? What is the locus of memory? There are two answers I can give to that question. Um, one is, under some condition, when a neurosurgeon operates on patients doing open brain surgery, the patient's usually awake or has to be awake. Mm -hmm. And what you can sometimes get when the surgeon stimulates with electrical current, you can get that the uh, patient remembers very discrete episodes that she might not have thought of for 20 years. She remembers, oh yeah, that's the music I heard when I, I during my wedding that took place 20 years ago. And you stimulate three times and the patient three times has this very discrete memory. Now, we don't know whether this, you know, the, the current, the electrical current from the electrode, how far and how wide that spreads, but at least says that local stimulation can be sufficient to, to give rise to very specific repeatable memories. Okay. The other fact I can add is a discovery I, I partake in, in myself. So we worked since um, many years with Dr. Isaac Fried, who's a, a neurosurgeon at UCLA. And for, um, we work on epileptic patients. And um, Dr. Fried um, um, implants microelectrodes into their brains in order to locate where the seizure is, from which, where's the foci from which the, uh, the, the seizure originates, because then he can uh, later in uh, go in and take that out and the patient is seizure free. What we discovered during those experiments, when those, so now we have maybe 100 wires inside the brain of a patient, and we can listen to the discharge of individual neurons. So we can hear individual neurons sort of fire away. They have this staccato-like, very typical sound, da, 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 these pulses which, which they communicate and which neuroscientists are trying to decipher. And what we there discovered to our surprise and everybody else's surprise, that you can find neurons that are amazingly specific. So in one famous neuron by now, we, uh, we had a patient who knew Jennifer Aniston, the, the American, uh, the Hollywood star, and, and um, had seen her many times on, on TV and in her movies. And so every time we showed a picture, so what we do, the patient is sitting there on a, on a bed in, in, in Itzhak Fried's ward, and uh, the, 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 we show different images that come on the monitor, and every time we, an image, a different image of Jennifer Aniston came up, this neuron fired in a very reproducible way. And, and it only fired to this, it didn't fire to other actresses, it didn't fire to other female women or to women in general. So it's something very specific. In another patient, we have neurons that fire into Mother Teresa or to Barack Obama. Yeah. And so it turns out that for things that you're very familiar with, your family, your loved ones, your friends, your, the actors you watch, the people you interact with every day, they are individual neurons that seem to respond amazingly specific. In some cases, you can just have the text. Um, where, where you see the text or where, where a voice has a name and the neuron will respond to it. And, and, and it won't respond to other things? Or, or, so, so this is a difficult question to answer because we don't have infinite time. There are probably a few thousand people that you personally know, yeah. and we don't have time to show each of these people. So all we can say within the universe of, of images we show is typically on the order of 100, 150 images. Some neurons will only fire to different images of the same individual or to the text, to the name of the individual, or to a computer voice saying the name of the, of the and individual. And it won't fire to any, anything else? No, so, so some neurons will fire very selective. Some neurons will, will have less selectivity. Some yeah, neurons yeah, yeah. will fire, for example, to all animals right. or to all people. But, but we find a small fraction of neurons that are so specific, they seem to fire only to very few things. Yeah. Now, we, what we're emphatically not saying, to immediately say that we're not stating that this neuron own, there's, there's only one neuron that will be active when you think of Jennifer Aniston. We think that's right. extremely unlikely. Right, there will right, be probably right. maybe a thousand, maybe ten thousand neurons that code specifically for Jennifer Aniston. It may well be that these neurons, that some of those neurons also call, uh, you know, code for John Lennon, or for the Pope, or for, for, for somebody else that you've met or that you've encountered. They're all uh, part of, of different circuits. And correct. So, so, so neurons can be part of multiple circuits. Exactly, correct. And so this tells us something about the, loca, uh, the locus, but it doesn't say that this one neuron is the unique locus, or this is where the memory is. But certainly this neuron is part of a small circuit that seems to be closely related to the percept and the memory of Jennifer Aniston. Uh, can, can we go down some levels and say, well, how does that happen? H how would it happen that the, 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 the words on paper or the visual uh, impact of Jennifer Aniston would actually cause those spikes. What, what, what is the process? How do you get to that? The process is that the brain 
realize this is a, we're talking about a very high level part of the brain here. We're not right, talking right, about right. an early part. If I were to do this in an early part, let's say of the visual brain, obviously the neuron would not respond to the sound or might not respond to right, the text, but just right. to aspects of a, of a right, face. Right. The, the, the brain has, an, has algorithms running. You can think of them like learning algorithms. They're unsupervised and it encounters the same pattern again and again. Let's say always, uh, you know, from five to six yeah. when, the, when a show is on, the brain encounters the same pattern that codes for Jennifer Anderson. And so the brain has ways of learning that and then saying, oh, there's a there's a more efficient way to represent that by a small number of neurons because I encounter this pattern again and again. Mm. And if you, if there's a different pattern of a different actor or somebody else comes into your life and you encounter her, again, the brain, and we can simulate some of these things on computers. We have computer simulations of, of these algorithms. So we have some idea how the brain managed to do this in a fairly automatic way that bypass all consciousness. You have no yeah, idea this, course, goes, this, this goes on in your head. Right, right, right. And so what are the implications of that to, to, the, to the nature of, of memory? What, what does it tell us? I know it tells us that in, in, in this case, you might not need millions or billions of neurons in order to have a, to have a discrete percept mm. or a discrete mm. memory. It might well be possible in the, in, in the fullness of time that we can sort of using some sort of fancy matrix-like interface that we can access those memories and directly read out uh, in patients that are, you know, that are, that are brain compromised, that we can directly read out the content of people's memory in this way. And, and just for context, uh, if you have a little pea-sized part of the cerebral cortex, uh, how many neurons w would, would be uh, there, 100,000 or yeah, more? Yeah, so in a, in a grain of rice, I once measured Great. this by myself, in a okay. grain of rice, there are a little bit less than a million neurons. million. And another interesting fact is if I take this grain of rice in a dog, in a monkey, in a mouse, in a human, they pretty well all look the same. Uh. And it will take an expert neuroanatomist to say, okay, this is a mouse and this is a human. The okay. difference is we have just vastly more of it than a mouse, uh, roughly a thousand times more. But the basic hardware, certainly in mammals, is pretty much similar. So one would think then that the core concept of memory, how you remember things, is very similar. Correct.